Welcome to the Golden Pathway Zoom Seminars. We are so excited to have you with us today. We cover the teachings of the Ascended Masters and their connections to all of the seven major world religions. We have recordings every year on different topics ranging from relationships to finances to healing your psychology. And this year, our theme is practicing spirituality. And we are very excited to hear about oils of the Bible and ancient texts from our beloved Anne Bethel in Australia. So this information packed session will help us to learn more about essential oils mentioned in the Bible, as well as in ancient texts, and find out about anointing, incense, and spiritual aromatherapy, as well as aromatherapy secrets of the Kabbalah. You will hear what the Ascended Masters have to say about various oils, including our messenger Elizabeth Clare Prophet's revel revelation on an anti-entity oil. I know we all could use that. So come and explore with us the power of nature's remedies and aromatherapy therapy's ability to support your body's natural healing process and spiritual acceleration. We're so excited to have Anne Bethel with us today. She was born in England, now lives in Bendigo, northwest of Melbourne, Australia. She has in-depth knowledge of aromatherapy, having practiced and lectured on it for over 30 years. Carol Ann has lived and traveled extensively throughout Ireland, Europe, and the Middle East. She also lived and worked with the Bedouins in Arabia and has been a nurse in the wilds of Papua New Guinea. So she has two perspectives on essential oils, the kind of new age perspective as well as a medical perspective. Welcome, Carol Ann Bethel. We are so glad to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now. I'm just getting into this. Okay, we go to a slideshow. So, welcome today to our wonderful exploration, if you would like, of the aromatherapy as is given in the Bible. And aromatherapy in the Bible doesn't only mean oils, it also means incense and other things too, as we'll discover as we go along. We'll be working today on the sixth ray of healing, which is the ministration and Jesus. And this is purple, gold, with a tiny fleck of ruby. Excuse me just a moment while I just get a pointer. There we go. A tiny fleck of ruby just there. Now from this slide, if there are two words to remember, we remember the name of Jesus and ruby because they will appear frequently during this session and there is a wonderful story at the end about them both. The oils of the Bible, well, there are 33 oils mentioned in the Bible, and 68 times the word incense is used. All of these slides will be in your handouts, so I won't be reading out absolutely everything that is on the slide, because I know that you can go to the handout section and find the complete slideshow there. There are some quotes for you, and they speak of the oil of joy, the oil of gladness, and to rejoice the heart. They're not known, of course, as oils in the Bible. They're nearly always referred to as sweet savers. This is an Egyptian hieroglyph, which is on a house in, in ancient Egypt. But the hieroglyphs down the side indicate that these are indeed oils or waxes, as they're termed in those days, which were used for healing. And that dated back, they were said to be precious, sweet savers. And they're essential oils, basically, from 4,500 years before Jesus. And that makes them 6,500 years approximately today. Now, within that house, they did find some of these pots that were broken. And there was a residue in that pot, which when it was reconstituted, was found to be a medicinal salve, which is an ointment. Frankincense in the Bible is known as olibanum. And there are three different kinds available on the market today. There's the sacred boswellia, which comes from Arabia, the carteri, which comes from Africa. Now, Howard Carter was the gentleman who discovered the tomb of King Tutankhamun, and I think this oil was named after him, but I wasn't able to ascertain that for sure. Boswellia serrate is from India, and that's Ayurvedic in nature. 
and used in Ayurvedic medicine. The most important thing to know about frankincense is that it balances hormones and helps hold the balance as long as frankincense is used. And also the iron cerebral channels. Now, in the brain, one nerve does not touch another nerve. Where they meet, there is a space between the two. And that space is filled with neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are guided, made from and part of the iron cerebral channel network. And frankincense was found to open these channels within the brain. In other words, it helps you understand and it helps your brain work better. It's a cleanser. It melts uh, obstacles within your brain by the very nature of that oil of frankincense. And here we can see a modern day priest using the oil, or oh, this frankincense, not the oil, but using frankincense in his censer in the church. It's a very gentle oil, and it comes, frankincense, the word from two French words, franc en son, which means pure lightning, and it certainly is. This is a tree of, his, uh, of a frankincense tree, and all those little white scars are marks where some gentleman with a knife has scarred the tree. And when he does that, there's a resin that oozes out and that resin crystallizes into little nuggets or crystals of frankincense. And this is the oil, some of the little nuggets just there. Essential oil of frankincense is made by distilling these nuggets. Essential oil of frankincense also has its own mudra which is very important in certain conditions, particularly grief and emotional trauma, such as post-traumatic post stress disorder and certainly ADHD. And if it's used regularly, it prevents the highs and the lows that are common to these particular conditions, whether you use it as an oil or whether you burn the actual crystals of frankincense. Frankincense is well known in Kabbalah, frankincense is hot now for those who are not familiar with it Ein Sof is up the top or God and he emanated 10 facets of his personality which had their own names and their own name of God and he they all have a different use they are the tools that God used to contact us and we are down here right down below much further down just there but Gavura who is the center of judgment is Isaac frankincense is hot and Shekinah needs to get to both of them. Shekinah resides in Malhut. And when Ein Sof dictates a judgment is due, she travels up to Hod and to Gavura to collect that judgment. And then she travels back again and then down to us, usually at night, to deliver both influence from God, but also those same judgments. We're going to talk about now the four holy anointing oils. They are used together, not individually, and when they are blended together, they produce a wonderful sweet aroma. Galbanum is ferula gumosa, and ferula means a schoolmaster's rod. This, as you can see, is a well-rounded oil with ingredients or chemical ingredients in various areas of the chart, and it's called Thai ginger because they do look alike, but they do not smell alike. Galbanum is the most foul of all oils I personally have ever smelled. It is used in the heart of the temple in Exodus, and that's what it looks like, the flower. It balances emotions and is very good. So combined with frankincense, which balances hormones, you've got quite a powerful unit there. It has the foulest odor, and it's said to be like really bad body odor, feet odor, or axilla odor. And it's due to some tiny, tiny ingredients that are cumin-like. They're not exactly cumin. They haven't been named, but they're in such infinitesimal qualities within that particular oil. But when they are mixed together with the three other oils, it is the sweetest of aromas. Essential oil of myrrh is comophorid myrrh, and it's quoted one. 156 times in the Bible. The most important thing about that is that it's very good for ulcers, whether they are mouth ulcers, leg ulcers, stomach ulcers, duodenal ulcers. It has a healing property with ulcers, which is quite magnificent. It's also, like frankincense, hormone-like, and it is the oil or the crystals that are used in embalming. 
And if we look at this oil, it's totally hydrophilic. All the ingredients are in the top half of the chart. Queen Esther used it, and it is known as the perfume of the dead. Myrrh is also mentioned in Kabbalah. This is the actual flower of myrrh, and you'll see that the tree is very much like the frankincense tree, and they do exactly the same. They cut the tree, collect the resin, and these are some of the resins of myrrh in their hard form. They would distill these resins, and in the distillation, that's how they get the essential oil of myrrh. When we looked at frankincense, we were looking at the female side of this chart, but myrrh is on the male side. Myrrh is Hesed, and Hesed is Abraham. Hesed emanated this next one, which is called Dechak, and he, or she, he is totally dependent on Hesed because he was emanated from there, but in the Kabbalah he is known as a bag of myrrh. When they work together, they unite Shekinah with Teferit. Now, this is very important because Shekinah and Teferit are said to be husband and wife. They were separated after the debacle in the Garden of Eden, and Jewish people around the world pray daily for the unification of Shekinah and Teferit. When we do our decrees, as long as we are doing them according to God's holy will, we are also uniting Shekinah and Teferit, and that is magical. And the reason it is so is because when Shekinah rises to Teferit, Malkut follows her. Then Yesod follows them. Hod and Netzach jump on board. And then Teferit starts to rise. And he keeps rising, collecting Sviroth, Hesed and Gavura join him. Bina and Hockman join him just before Teferit gets to Keter. So now Teferit and Keter, all the Sviroth are now collected together in Keter. And then Keter rises back to Ein Sof from whence he came. So this is a very important move, and it's called the unification of the Sphiroth. And it only occurs when we use essential oil of myrrh and the appropriate decrees and calls. And we will be talking about that unification a little bit more further on. It's also interesting to note that both Hod and Netzach are known as the Sphiroth of Prophecy. And there was a wonderful prophetess in the book of Kings, in the second book of Kings, called Deborah who sat under a palm tree and prophesied, and she was well-renowned for using essential oil of frankincense and myrrh prior to her prophecies. Now we're going to be talking about the third holy anointing oil, which is cinnamon. And that number five up the top there is very important. Out of the whole world of essential oils, which must number at least a thousand, I don't have an exact number of which oils are available or where, there are only five that it is recommended that you don't deal with because they have ingredients in them which can cause problem. And they are called the falcron five. There's cinnamon, cassia, which we're going to deal with in a moment. There's thea, mugwort and sage. But they are said to be too dangerous to use without advanced knowledge. There's another one you can find. But cinnamon is cinnamonium zelanicum, or salon cinnamon. And the cinnamon bark is the most potent of all oils. And the reason is these aldehydes just here, 80% of aldehydes, which are very drying. Now, you see this gentleman has just debarked this cinnamon tree. And if you look carefully at the end, you can see a little tiny, tiny bit of the inner bark just there. That inner bark is what they use to distill, to make cinnamon. Now, when you go into a shop to buy cinnamon for your cooking, it's always a little brown curly stick. Well, that's where it comes from. That's the inner bark of the cinnamon tree. And that's what they use with steam distillation to produce essential oil of cinnamon. Solomon used it in his temple in the book of Proverbs. And as you can see, it's well-rounded. It has little bits and ingredients everywhere. Cassia is the second oil of um, the Cassia 5 and the fourth one of our holy anointing oils. This is the last one of the holy anointing ones. And you'll notice that it's all, this one is all hydrophilic. All the ingredients are in the bottom half of the chart. And this is known as Cinnamonium Cassia. It isn't cinnamon, but it is very closely related to cinnamon. It's known as Chinese cinnamon. 
And what is interesting about this oil is it's much sweeter than cinnamon, which is very interesting because it's used in pre-diabetes, diabetics, and obesity, post-menstrual premenstrual syndrome, diarrhea, and circulation. Now, when we say that we use this oil for diabetes, it is most important that if you choose to follow this path, that you are making your physician aware of what you are doing. If you monitor it by your blood sugar levels and you notice that casea is helping you, and go back to your doctor and ask for his opinion as to whether your medication should be adjusted. Do not take this path on your own without medical supervision. This oil was believed to have been brought from Egypt during the exodus with Moses. Just recently, it's been used in salmonella cases and been found very, very effective. So those tests are going ongoing. And when they take the bark of the tree for this particular case here, now this particular cinnamon, branch of cinnamon, they only take a strip because, again, it's so potent, they only need a little part of it. Hyssop is our number five oil. This is, we've finished with the anointing oils now. We're just talking about oils that are in the Bible. And this is the herb of Joseph, a very, very important oil. As you can see, it's got three ingredients like sandalwood has, just three areas where all the ingredients are packed into three areas. God instructed his children to use ceremonial cleansing of people and houses with hyssop officialis. When Jesus was on the cross, he was given wine vinegar to drink, and it was on a sponge on the end of a hyssop stalk. And it's used for appetite loss, cramps, colds, and colds and coughs. It looks like lavender, but it's not lavender. Now, this oil is hyssop officianis, and it's part of the Falcon 5. But there is another hyssop on the market, which is quite different. And this is the same family, but a different oil grown in a different place for a different reason. And this one is very safe for adults and pregnant ladies and infants. We've had a situation which I've actually worked with when we gave a baby a suppository containing this particular essential oil because the baby couldn't breathe and it wasn't known whether it was asthma or bronchitis. And within 35 seconds, that baby could breathe. That's how powerful this oil is. And that is because when you give a suppository loaded with essential oils, it goes through the wall of the bowel and the inferior vena cava takes it to the heart and the heart immediately dispatches it to the lungs to pick up oxygen. But it's going outside the inside of the lungs. It's not being breathed in. It's being fed by the blood vessels. So it helps open the alveoli in the case of asthma. It helps deal with the mucus in the case of bronchitis. And it's a very simple thing to do. Essential oil of spike nard is nardostichus jatamansi. The nard is commonly known as the nard or nard muskroot. Now, Elizabeth Clare Prophet said it was good to have musk oil on the altar. There is another musk oil on the market which you need to be aware of. And this musk oil, not the one I'm pointing to here, but the other one, the other one is comes from the anal glands of a musk ox, which is found in Queensland, uh, Greenland and in southern Alaska. This is the one we're talking about today. And this is the one that we're, Jesus, uh, Mary of Bethany, Jesus' twin flame, anointed Jesus' feet with an ointment of spikenard. It's anti-inflammatory and it has wonderful things to be used for, including pancreatitis. But when you first start with pan sp uh, spikenard, it's important to realize it has 50% sesquiterpenes. Now, these are healers and they promote healing. And if the body that you're giving it to is very high with toxins, this can make them quite ill. So it's better to start with the using it in an infuser only, not putting it directly onto the skin until the person is familiar with this oil and then you can do as Mary did and anoint the skin with the ointment. This is what the plant looks like and it has on its roots down here the fat roots are called rhizomes and the other roots are just the tendrils and it is the distillation of these roots that give us this wonderful oil. Cedarwood is a very yang oil 
Look at all these ingredients on the yang side of the chart. Nothing on the yin side. This is a male oil. Cedrus Atlantica, Atlantic cedar, Atlas cedar. Solomon built his temple with cedarwood and cypress. It's used for wisdom and again, like frankincense, improves cerebral activity. And it is the only oil I know of that is used to help with leprosy. Jesus' cross was made of cedar wood. This is a cedar wood tree, and if you notice, it's a silvery grey colour, and there are fronds dangling down. And this is a log or a trunk going off to be processed of Atlas cedar. But there is another cedar wood, and I do thank Linda Cruz Robin for telling me about this. I didn't know about this one, and this one is called Cedrus. Deodora, and it comes from Himalaya. And look at the leaves on this one. It's a dark green and nothing's dangling just there. And it has a different pine cone to most other oils. And if you look at it, it's absolutely loaded with tiny, tiny ingredients. And 42 of those ingredients only appear in trace elements. There is a pearl of wisdom associated with this, which I strongly suggest that you read because it gives you lots of tips in there. And in the footnotes, it tells us that Devadora is a Sanskrit word for wood of the gods. Guru Ma said, Diyoda is a very sacred oil of the pine family and is an entity repellent, the oil focus of the Holy Spirit. And in the book called The Path of Immortality by Elizabeth Clare Prophet, it says entity repellents include deodar, rose, pine, fresh mint, and frankincense. The forests of deodar were sacred places for religious practice. Now, obviously, I can't put everything on the screen, but Linda again came through and she gave me a link, which is the overview of therapeutic benefits. And that is the link that Linda gave me. And this name here, Amrita, I believe from there you can actually purchase the oil if you so desire. That's Cedarwood Himalayan, the Adora. I'd like to say at this point in time that if you think about the word disease, D-I-S-E-A-S-E, -E, and you separate it into D-I-S hyphen E-A-S-E, -E, that describes our maladies. We have a lack of ease, a dis ease, a lack of ease. And I believe that most of the problems that we have today have an entity component to them. And simply using deodar in, on top of the other oils that you're using may be that magic ingredient that actually stops the, that particular thing happening. I put a drop of deodar on the base of my skull every morning, so does my husband, and that is where the entities are supposed to hang on. From there. I also put it on my solar plexus for emotional balancing. But on one occasion, I noticed that with my husband, he was coughing and splashing all the way through decrees, and he doesn't normally do that. And I gave him deodar, and I said, put it on the top of your sternum and tap for 30 seconds. And he did, and he didn't cough or splutter all the way through the decrees. So sometimes there may be an entity component to your lack of, of ease. And if that is so, I humbly suggest that you try Deodar on top of the other things you're doing. The essential oil of Cyprus is Cypressus sempiverens, and it has over 40 ingredients, all of them in infinitesimal amounts. And this wood was used for building weapons, the handles of spears and swords. Noah's Ark was built from gopher wood, which is Cyprus wood. And it's used for several different things, but to draw your attention to this little line here, it promotes local clotting. Now, if you have an injury, for example, on your arm and it won't stop bleeding, tip some oil of cypress directly into it, clean dressing, hand on top, pressure, and it will stop bleeding. But there are many people in our society today who are prescribed drugs to do the opposite of that. They want to stop Rotting. For example, after having a heart attack or a pulmonary embolism, there's a whole world of stuff out there. Warfarin is one of the drugs that they still use today. 
So before you use this oil, it's worth the question, may I ask, are you taking any drugs which, include, which are designed to stop clotting? And if you are, choose another oil. Do not use this one. Because although that is meant to promote local clotting, we are all different and we all react differently and we don't want to take any chances. Essential oil of sandalwood is known as the oil of joy and gladness. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea brought sandalwood and myrrh to anoint Jesus' body. In today's value, that would be worth 200,000 US dollars. It's also known as aloes in the Bible. Now, the perfume trees of God's will, this is Kabbalah. Kabbalah teaches us that the trees of life, that is the sphorotic tree from Kabbalah and Mark's chart of your own divine self and your mighty I am presence, all of these emit spiritual perfume. And all the trees in the Garden of Eden all exude perfume. And I'd like to share with you the story of Rabbi Simeon ben Yohai who made many notes about his ancient teachings. And from those notes, M Moses de Leon wrote the Zohar, the book which is kind of like the Bible to the uh, Kabbalists. So M Rabbi, um, Rabbi Simeon ben Yohai took his ascension publicly. And when he did that, all the people came out of their houses because they smelt this wonderful perfume. And wondering what it was, they all came out and they saw Rabbi Simeon ben Yohai rising and rising into the sky, trailing clouds of perfume. And they said he was lit up like the sun as he rose higher and higher. As far as we know, that was the per first public ascension that we've been uh, that we know about from Kabbalah. Everything emits a perfume of some size, shape, or description if it is according to God's will. And it is Christmas, so we're just going to talk about gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, our beloved El Moria incarnated as Melchior, and he brought gold to the king. And this is gold just here. These little nuggets are one ounce of gold. And he brought gold to the king because gold is the highest metal and it is known, gold is known, as the, gold, the metal that is fit for a king. The second person was our beloved Kathumi, who incarnated as Balthazar. And he was a young man. He was not an old man. And he brought frankincense from Arabia to worship the high priest in acknowledgement that Jesus already was aware of his mighty eye and presence and his holy Christ self, even as a baby. And that's the frankincense that we saw before. And the third one, of course, was our beloved Caspar. And Caspar brought, oops, sorry, got a bit too happy there with my fingers. <laughs> Sorry about that. He brought myrrh from Sabah in Yemen. And that is known as perfume for the dead. And he brought that in acknowledgement that in this incarnation, Jesus would need the perfume of the dead. That's the story of our three wise men. Frankincense and myrrh was burned in the temple in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 2. And in today's values, the essential oil of myrrhs and frankincense would be worth more than the first gift of gold. Now we're going to look at spiritual aromatherapy of incense and roses. This word incense is very important because it gives us the word scent, C -E. Sorry, S-C-E-N-T. And these quotes are from Kabbalah. They're from Tishbi. And at the end of the print, uh, presentation today, I'll uh, point out on the bibliography where you can find those details. Kabbalah says it is sent alone that sustains the world. The soul only survives by scent. We smell myrtle as the Sabbath departs. The world could not survive human sin if this was not so. 
Now, those are profound statements, and we need to understand why Kabbalah says that and what it means. So we need to go back, first of all, with a little bit of history. When Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, God ordered Moses to build a tabernacle complex of these dimensions here, and all the 12 tribes of Israel parked or camped on each side of this complex. Inside that complex would be the place called the Holy Place, and the Holy of Holies was the segment of that building which had to be in the west and it contained the ark of the covenant which contained the ten commandments and it was known as the holy of holies and there was a curtain separating it and only the highest priest was allowed into the holy of holies the main mortals would enter through the east gate just here and the first place they would come across is the bronze altar now this is very important and it doesn't happen today and what we're going to tell you now is something directly from kabbalah elizabeth claire prophet said that there are some things in the bible that don't make sense and kabbalah holds the keys to those and this is one of those keys the bronze altar was for the sacrifice of the lamb. It doesn't happen today. But God did not require necessarily the death of a lamb. What he required was the white smoke that goes up, which was a sign of Israel's obedience to him and their willing to sacrifice, willingness to sacrifice to him. The carcass that was left was for something else, and it was very important. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, it said, I form the light and I create evil. When God says he formed something, it means he made something out of something that was already in existence and he formed light from his own essence. But he created evil from nothing, the same as he created us. And the evil inclination or the other side, as described by Kabbalah, are children of God the same as we are. And he had put them on this earth for one specific reason. Well, actually, two. The first one was to give us a choice. Otherwise, we have free will. Otherwise, we'd only have to choose between good and good. We wouldn't have a choice. But the second reason, and the most probably the most important reason, as Kabbalah says it, was because somebody somewhere at some time had to take care of the carcasses, whether it's ours or whether it was the lamb. So that when we ascend, when we take out of our body, when we go up to the ascend temples of the ascended masters, when we make our transition, then the carcass that is left decomp decomposes. And even if it's put into the fire of cremation, then there is still a amount of decomp decomposition there. And that is the realm of the Sitrahara or the other side. And the other side has that right to be fed according to Kabbalah because they are also something that he created. So then when we finished at the altar, we go to the bronze lavar. Now, lavar means washing, the same as lavender means washing. And they would wash their hands and presumably their garments if necessary before they entered the holy place. And in the holy place, we would have the table of showbread. And then we would have the menorah in the south just there, which is the seven-tiered candlestick. But look at this. Right next door to the holy of holies is a second altar. And this is the altar of incense. So outside, we have prayers and sacrifice on the bronze altar. But inside, we have, we have the sacrifice of incense on the altar of incense. So that makes a little bit more sense of those first things that we read. But there's more. No evil power, no accuser can withstand incense. The importance of prayer and incense cannot be underestimated. Prayer is the most exalted, but incense is most beloved of God and is precious. Prayer is needed by God. He needs to hear our prayers. He needs to know what we need. He needs to hear our praise of him. But incense brings joy to the world, the entire world of the Godhead. Prayer demands action. It's a request, even if it's to praise God, it would do, the action is that God then blesses us. Incense sanctifies, strengthens Shekinah. Prayer is re replaced animal sacrifice, but incense is the new sacrifice. Prayer makes necessary restoration. If we want to confess and repent, we need words to do that to God, and therefore that's prayer. 
but more precious than all other forms of practice of worship in the world is the practice of incense. Prayer helps sporotic unity, and incense helps harmony to balance the sphere of. Prayer is a communication between the upper worlds and the lower worlds, but incense is a physical bridge between the upper and the lower worlds. Prayer is done at the outside altar, but incense is only done at the inside altar with repentance to make it effective. Sacrifice is shared with the Sitrahara, but incense is never shared. It binds the Sitrahara. The priest Aaron invented a service called the Mikata Kataret service, which means perpetual incense unto the Lord. It removes impurities and cleanses the sanctuary. But what we really need is a balance between the two. We need both. One is not more important than the other, but they need to be used in balance. Both are needed. Incense makes light. Now, how can that be? Well, again, this is one of those mysteries that only Kabbalah can explain. We just learn from Isaiah 45, verse 7, that God said, I form light. So how can incense do that? Well, Moses was ordered to take for yourself sweet savors for your benefit. Now, that doesn't make much sense unless we understand that Moses represents to ferret. To ferret is in the heart of the child. And later on, when Jesus came, it was Jesus who was in the heart of the child. Incense makes light by removing Sitrahara from Shekinah. Now, Sitrahara is the other side. Shekinah is the female potential of God. So why would Shekinah have Sitrahara that needed to be removed? Well, again, Kabbalah. Every night, as we said before, particularly under the influence of, of uh, frankincense, Shekinah delivers judgments to the earth down below, and then she returns. And to do so, she's got to go through the kingdom of the husks. According to Kabbalah, we would know it as the astral plane. And in the astral plane are all the negative things, the re results of the shells that broke, the sphere off that broke, and they cling to Shekinah because they were also made by God. And they see Shekinah, they see the light, and they can't wait to get back to God. So they make a beeline for Shekinah, and they grab onto her. And as you can see from those little claws there, it's not easy to get rid of them. And so it's very difficult because then she becomes very heavy. And she has to rise, if you would like, all the way back up here with all that weight on her. But it is incense that removes the Sitrahara from Shekinah and sends them back to the astral plane so that Shekinah can rise. It enables her to rise to Teferit and receive sanctuary and light from above and as we said before then the entire tree goes up there and the tree then when it's all one bond when it's united returns to iron soft these little husks that i found here are called devil's claw sea pods and that's precisely what they do to shekinah so cleaning shekinah is the first step the second step is atonement for sins by sacrifice. It's an exalted incense offering. The restoration of unification is through song and prayer, and I would add decrees to that. Restoration of Shekinah is by concentration on the Tetragrammaton. What the goal is, is for the fear of to unite, to form a bond, to rise as one, to be subsumed back into Ein Sof from whence they came. And they take us with them because we lit the incense, we said the prayers, we helped with the cleansing of Shekinah. And that whole mechanism was facilitated by action on this earth here below. And it can only happen here. We are the only ones that can do it. Elizabeth Clare Prophet said, Ein Sof allowed us the privilege of cleaning up the husks and returning the light to Ein Sof. And that's what we're doing. 
On Friday night from St. Mark's uh, in Livingston, there was an ascension service where they talked about uh, the freedom of the elementals. And at the end of that service, Elizabeth Clare Prophet uh, did some decrees and what have you. And she said, tell the elementals they're coming home. It's very important that they know that we are coming home. So here, O oh universe, I am coming home with all the elementals I can carry. Now we're going to talk about the Rose of Sharon. Now, Rose of Sharon in Kabbalah is Shabbat Salet Hasharon. But there, unfortunately, there are four flowers by that name. One is a cactus, one is a hibiscus, and one is another rose. But the Jewish people today use Rosa Landaferis in their temples. So that's the one we're dealing with. And that's the one that has an essential oil. That is the Rose of Sharon, the pink version. There is a white version. The oils are exactly the same. But essential oil of Sharon needs to know, we need to know some things about that because it is an amemagogue. And a memagogue is something which promotes menstrual flow. In other words, it brings on a period. So we definitely don't want to do that if we're pregnant or give it to somebody who is pregnant. This is a big no-no because we really don't know what will happen there. It is also a vulnerary. Now, a vulnerary means it's a skin healer. In the desert where these flowers grow, the, the sheep, the goats go into the bushes to get these flowers. They taste apparently very sweet. And so consequently, they get scratched and torn by the thorns in these bushes. So the shepherds will pull all the thorns out of their fleece and they will find inevitably a head of a flower of Rose of Sharon and they will rub it into the wounds and the wounds never fester because it's antioxidant, antimicrobial, antibacteria. It actually elevates the moods. Apparently the animals just stand there and love having this treatment. This is the name of a research uh, article that I found from Great Britain, which was I thought was very interesting on the Rose of Sharon, Rosa Landaferis, if you so care to check that up. And this is the white one. The oil is exactly the same, but it has a deep, diffusive, musky sweet smell with balsamic undertones. Now, this is essential oil of Rosa Landaferis or oil of Sharon. And as you can see here, I'll take the top off the bottle and you can see that the bottle is full. I'm holding this over my keyboard, but I'm not at all frightened to turn it upside down because it's a solid oil. It's a waxed oil and it's the waxes that make it solid. You can either stand it in a cup of hot water or you can pop it in your pocket for a while. Or the other choice is to take a stick an orange stick and you can just pop it in there and the oil is red and then the best thing to do with it is to put it somewhere to warm it i'm putting it on the back of my hand here because if you rub it together like that the heat then releases the aroma and i can tell you <laughs> it is such a crime that i cannot share that smell with you except to describe it as deep diffusive musky sweet with balsamic undertones it's available from Ahimsa Oils in Australia, and that is their um, contact details there. The lady there is called Sandy, and she's only too pleased to talk to you about the oils. They hate making these oils, decanting them, because in Australia, where it's very hot, even that's not enough to melt the oil. They have to turn all the air conditioners off and put heaters on so that the bottles are hot, the containers are hot, so they can decant the oil. But she, she's quite happy to send oils like that overseas. Now, this is a tribute to Brenda, our Reverend Brenda here in Melbourne. Brenda did all of this research, so we thank her for this. Jesus said, I would have you unto the Rose of Sharon of my heart. The Rose of Sharon of my heart. Jesus said in 60.02, it is finished, unfolding its petals like the Rose of Sharon in my heart. Archangel Zadkiel said, the Rose of Sharon, the rose that blooms in the desert of matter, whose perfumed essence is indeed a bit of heaven come down to earth, born to earth, is symbolic of the hidden Christ nature ensconced within the heart of every man as the sacred threefold flame, blazing love, light and power. Elizabeth Clare Prophet said, the Rose of Sharon 
is a being equated with a Christ consciousness. The Rose of Sharon is another name for Jesus. So when it's appropriate, we can substitute the names. Now, this is the story of the ruby. Right back at the beginning, I said to you, a little tiny feck of ruby, the names of Jesus and a ruby come together at the end. This is a ruby. This is a modern ruby. It's worth $34.8 million. And this, this is a story from the whole Hebrew word study. It's quoting the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 1, which says, I am the Rose of Sharon. There is an old rabbinical story about a king, thought to be Solomon, who acquired the largest ruby in the world. He was so delighted, he gave it to the royal jeweler to polish it and make it perfect. The jeweler examined it and looked at it and with a practiced eye, and he said, quite nervously, he said, Your Majesty, there is a crack in this stone, and there is the crack. Well, fix it, declared the king. I cannot, replied the jeweler, even more nervously. However, I can cut it into three smaller pieces and it will be beautiful and perfect. But the king said, no, then it will not be the biggest. It will not be the best. The king hired a number of jewelers, but not one knew how to fix the crack and turn the jewel into a large, beautiful and perfect ruby. One day a visitor came to the palace. He saw the ruby and asked permission of the king to examine it. After a long period of examination, he said, I can make your stone into something beautiful. And the king asked, will it be big? Will it be beautiful? And will it be perfect? And the visitor replied, yes, yes, and yes. Everywhere in the palace, you could hear the grinding and polishing. It took three days and finally, the jeweler approached the king with the jewel covered in a black cloth. Is it still big? Is it still beautiful? And is it perfect? Yes, yes, and yes, replied the jeweler. But the crack, how did you get rid of the crack? It is still there, replied the visitor. And with that, he removed the black cloth to reveal the biggest, most beautiful and most perfect ruby in the world, at the centre of which was carved the most beautiful rose. The crack had become the stem. The king was awed and did something very unusual for him. He was silent. He just stared in wonder at the world's biggest, most beautiful and most perfect jewel. We all may have many flaws, but God created us as a beautiful gemstone. We only need the Rose of Sharon, Jesus, to take out our flaws and make something beautiful out of it, out of that gemstone. It is the Rose of Sharon, Jesus, who gives us beauty for our ashes. Ascended Lady Master Nada said, let then the altars of this retreat and the altars of the keepers of the flame in the earth experience once a day a little of the flame of fragrance, a little fragrance of frankincense burning, that you might also know that Moira himself steps through the veil of frankincense. Thank you, beloved El Moria. Thank you. This is a bibliography of the aromatherapy we use today. My details are on the top, should you need them. And this is a bibliography of Kabbalah. And this is principally the one that we used by Tishbi today. The information in this service is, is intended for your educational use only and is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition and before undertaking dietary modifications. There are some resources for oils there and resources for ongoing education. I would like to thank you all personally for attending today and for sharing these wonders with us. I'd like to thank Patricia and Linda Cruz Robin and, of course, Rosa Linda and our Reverend Brenda in Melbourne. But thank you most of all to you. Merry Christmas and thank you. Thank you, Anne. That was wonderful. I used oh, to have a Rose of Sharon in my backyard. I never knew for 22 years the significance of it. I wish <laughs> I had heard this before. 
<laughs> Any questions or comments for Anne? I have a question. I'm a singer and we don't use scents because people are allergic to them. Is there any essential oil that would not trigger an allergy in somebody? Well, without knowing who the somebody is, I couldn't really answer that. <laughs> <laughs> but my my understanding is that with oils like Rosa Sharon, because they are wax based, they don't give off their perfume willingly. You have to heat it to get the perfume as such. So I should imagine the chances of allergy would be very minimal, but I couldn't say that it wouldn't be. <laughs> I haven't come across it yet, Patricia, no. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. If people have a sensitivity to certain oils, my question to them is, well, maybe they need a detoxification because the teaching with essential oils is that they don't, um, they don't incite an allergy as such because there's nothing in them to irritate that. But there is always an exemption to the rule. There is always with somebody who is different and in, the, in every case when people have gone through a detoxification they're no longer sensitive to it oh that's nice to know hmm. and and i have a question about let's say you were going to go to a concert or you wanted to put on an oil is there a certain amount of time that it would last so that you could put it on early and then maybe when you went to the public it wouldn't be noticeable well, oils go in and out of the body within two hours, Rosalinda. It mm. may be that the aroma may still hang about, but lavender hangs about. And uh, lavender is within the molecules of the skin. It does hang about lavender, uh, but it goes in and out of the body within two hours. So two hours is said to be the safety period. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. How do you get the information that you have been imparting to us? <laughs> that's a good question i get it from kabbalah and uh, from tishbe's book mostly and uh, most of the things today came out of tishbe's book i get it also from wikipedia and from national geographic i research a lot of those different sources and then i double check them against other sources too before i prevent them present them sorry but uh, I, I make many calls as to what is appropriate to present to you and what is not. And quite often I have to take slides out because they, I just feel they're not appropriate. So I put lay it before the masters, if you would like, before I present it to you. So I'm quite confident that the stuff that we've given you is accurate. And the yes, Bible, of course, I get a lot from the Bible. <laughs> you said there was a way to access this information. And that's what I'm asking for. It, it's I on see. the website, uh, Robert, uh, the Golden Pathway website, uh, okay. under seminars, and you'll find this seminar and the entire PowerPoint that she presented is there. Okay. Okay. Other questions or comments for Anne? I just want to mention, I know it probably came up in your other workshop that these oils based on where you get them and their strength could be different. So you're dealing with like the top quality oils here in this presentation. Absolutely. Thank you for that reminder, Rosalinda. And it's always best if you all, when you're ordering oils, if you want to blend oil, do it yourself. The best thing to do is to buy the pure oils yourselves, unadulterated, nothing added, nothing taken away, just 100% pure oils. And if you want to blend them, that's fine, but blend them yourself. Don't buy them as blends because you never know what's been put in there. They don't always have to declare. They can say natural substances, which they are, but it might be natural horseradish. <laughs> It doesn't actually have to say that, you know, and so consequently you need to be, I mean, get the pure oils yourselves and then blend them. But thank you for that, Rosalinda. Yeah. I can make a, a comment if I may. Unfortunately, a lot of the essential oils are distilled in aluminum distillers and not stainless steel. And now they've come out with something that looks like a washing machine. Uh, this is a new modern method and they put the foliage in there and turn it on to a certain temperature and eventually the essential oils come out through a uh, like a hose. And uh, unfortunately, they don't have the background on the proper temperature for like a resin, a bark or a flower. So you don't get the full components of the medicinal ingredients of the uh, plant. The other thing is the FDA. And these companies are compliant by a very low standard of the FDA. The FDA in the U.S. says if you have organic essential oil and you add petrochemicals, 
you can still put on the label organic. And so people think the whole thing is absolutely pure because it's, it's organic. But uh, uh, but that's not necessarily the case. It's a very compromising label. Just mm -hmm. a comment. Yeah. Thank you, Mar Maria. That was very interesting. Um, we don't have that situation in Australia because we have a different um, method of doing it. But uh, and our things are very strict here. They have to reach certain standards and... Uh, um, e even the um, producers of the oils are investigated and they are inspected regularly to make sure that, you know, what they're doing is right. Um, and I, I think that's very unfortunate and it, it leads people astray and it puts people off aromatherapy and it can be positively dangerous. I don't think it's a good idea at all and certainly not using aluminum as such. But I don't know what you do about it. But thank you for bringing that to people's attention, Maria. That's very important to know that. But they're blessing in our life, and uh, everybody, every household should have essential oils. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Maybe, the, maybe the bard as well. Yeah. Uh, the only ones that I know of that I can, uh, from my own experience, say that uh, I believe is 100% these are those produced by Kurt Schnorbelt. He is a doctor of chemistry. His yes. name and references are all in there. And he is the only one in America that I know of that produces 100% natural and, and doesn't use aluminium. And he's, he's very much a for fighter. He's very much in the foreground there and fighting for essential oils and the quality of them too, very much. He's um, very on the on the edge if you would like of doing good things yeah. yes i met him and i want to tell you he is the first person because he he is a german i believe and he was uh his career was chemistry when he came to america he uh, imported canisters of essential oils and the fda came and dumped them down the drain it was a, a terrible terrible thing to happen and dr gary young worked with him as well and he, uh, uh, he and, and Gary worked very, very hard in trying to import the oils, but he paid a great price for what we have today. And now, of course, he has a school and he's a wonderful, wonderful man and very intelligent. Yes. Well, Kurt Schnorbelt was the first uh, aromatherapy course that I did, which was called medical aromatherapy, as yeah. opposed to just the common garden aromatherapy. And he came out to Australia. And so consequently, there were quite a few people who did aromatherapy with him. And I'm eternally grateful for being guided to that class because I agree with you 100 percent. And that's why I put his educational things up on the slide, too. So if people want to do ongoing learning as well as obtain oils, that, that to me is the only place to get them from. Yes. And he does have a book, yeah, I think you, which you probably know about. Uh, he has, has a book on the chemistry and everything of its oils if you want to be a serious student. Yes. And there's another one called the Intelligence of Essential Oils, which is his latest one. And a lot of the charts and a lot of the things that we did today come from that book, The Healing Essential, The Healing Art, uh, The Healing Intelligence of Essential Oils. And that's in the book list at the, at the, on the sideshow. It's in the bibliography of the aromatherapy bibliography is there. Oh, great. That's a good information. Thanks. We've burned frankincense and myrrh in our in our altars. You said frankincense brings light and myrrh is the oil of the dead? Yeah. But more, <laughs> myrrh, all, myrrh, all, myrrh has many different things. It is the oil of the dead, but it is also, it helps unite to Shekinah with Teferit. Myrrh is the most important one for that unification thing. Frankincense is the deliverer of judgment. So Shekinah has two roots. She can either go the hod route with frankincense or she can go straight up to Teferit. And that's under the influence of myrrh. So the two together, which are hormone balancing, they work together. They're very much in harmony. Yeah. <laughs> but but it is, yeah, I think it's the oil of the dead simply because it is a wonderful aroma. <laughs> if yeah, you had to work with the dead, it would be something that you put in your face mask or. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Murr, Mur, as you know, you have to really dry the top off because you can't get the cap off uh, because it's on there so secure. It's a very different oil. But I'll just share an experience. I gave a, a, a myrrh to a friend for uh, a gift for Christmas, and she really didn't know very much about the oils. So they went to visit 
her husband's mother who had dementia in a hospital in Texas. So when we got and what they got there, they didn't realize how bad off she was. And so they they sat there for a couple of hours and she, she didn't even say anything. So uh, something made her get up and she dropped the oil of frankincense on her face and mm. and just left it there. And suddenly she says to her husband, how is your sister doing? And she started recollecting things and they were just astounded. But apparently she must have been inhaling through the limbic system, the, the oil drops of the myrrh that was on the face. And mm. so she, she thought I knew that it would do that, but I hadn't a clue. <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you maria <laughs> that's wonderful well thank you ann and everyone for being here and wishing you a very 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 merry christmas and a happy new year and we're going to kick off january with uh christine barrier and get an astrological update on the 21st of january so we'll look forward to seeing you back here then Thanks so much for coming. God bless and God victory. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. For hosting it. Thank you.